We're outnumbered 10 to 1. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Across the board in every yeah, issue. Yeah, everything. Right? Yeah. But you look around and see what the other side has done in terms of building institutions. And, of course, the way they build it, it's a lot easier because they just go, go to the government and say, give us a handout. You know, conservatives, by and large, won't do that. Building those institutions is so important in terms of how we change things. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. You know, I have a great privilege in leading the Heritage Foundation, and with that comes other privileges like hosting this show. And the reason it's such a privilege to host this show is because so many great Americans are willing to come be guests. And, and, and I mean it when I say it, that every guest feels like my favorite. That might really be true this week, especially because I get the longtime president of the Heritage Foundation, my friend, my mentor, Dr. Ed Fulner, to be with me. Ed, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to be here. Yeah. You know, when we started this show earlier this year in 2022, we kind of had a concept about what we wanted to do, which was to talk to different conservative voices. We'd be happy to talk to voices that aren't conservative too, but we didn't want anyone worried, so we just focused on conservatives right now. And, and as we were thinking about guests for the next year, and schedule, it occurred to us, we haven't yet had Ed Fulner on. <laughs> so thanks for being patient, not that you were lobbying to be on the show, but it's so fitting that uh, as it was, we sit here toward the end of 2022, which is a time of year that people start reflecting on the previous year, I'm reflecting on my year at Heritage, that you of all people would be one of our last guests for the year as we then go into the next one. So thanks so much, not only for being here, but for everything you've done for this country. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. What are you up to these days? I'm, as you know, uh, the Chungju Young Fellow here at Heritage. I head the Asian Study Center Advisory Board. My, one of my passionate uh, interests in, in terms of public policy remains U.S.-Asia interest. Uh, I'm very much involved in different parts of foreign policy, including Europe. I've been to Europe twice in the last month. And trying to reinforce all the best things that go on both internally in terms of bringing together parts of the conservative movement and also internationally reminding people that conservatives are still a very significant voice, not only in Washington, but throughout the United States. And in a lot of ways, I guess that'll be our theme. That is sort of the, the state of conservatism at home and abroad. What's your your kind of top level assessment of the answer to that question, especially abroad? Well, we'll talk about some of the domestic issues in a moment. Uh, mixed, but on balance, encouraging. You and I recently had the opportunity to meet with uh, former British Prime Minister Liz Truss, and that was kind of discouraging because she wanted to do all the right things, and she not only had to fight off the Labour opposition. She was being stabbed in the back by her own people. And boy, that's, that's not a way to advance our ideas and our objectives. On the other hand, off in Asia, you've got Korea and Japan talking to each other like they haven't in a very long time. You've got a great new president in Korea, President Yoon, who understands what the market is about. I, when he was president-elect, I had the opportunity to meet with him, and I said, uh, you know, Mr. President, to rank higher in the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom, you have to do more in terms of free markets and giving people more freedom to choose. He said, that's the name of Milton Friedman's book. I was given that as a high school graduate, and I read it. You know, uh, ideas really matter, you know, and they, they, they kind of transcend different cultures in, in different countries around the world. So uh, a lot of very positive things happening around the world, too, even as we, we look at, at certain disappointments. But it's always a mixed story. And that's one of the neat things that I'm so glad you're continuing in terms of things like our index of economic freedom. If, if we're going to improve something, it has to be measured. And you have to know what the baseline is. You know that as an historian, that, 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 that that's really essential if we're going to move forward. So with our index now in year 27 or 28, uh, we know where countries have been, we know where they are, we know what the prospects are, and frankly, I worry. You know, the United States is down to number 17 or 18. We used to be number five or six. 
this is not the way economic freedom should be promoted. But then again, I look around and I see, uh, I see Florida, I see Ohio, I see Texas. You know Texas. I know a little bit about Texas. Uh, uh, I see South Carolina. I see other sensible places. And increasingly, I'm seeing uh, my own governor, Governor Glenn Youngkin in, uh, in Virginia, doing the right kinds of things to encourage uh, freedom and free markets and uh, sensible people involvement whether it's Loudoun County school boards or whether it's uh, around the state and, and putting people in real, real people back in charge of parts of government locally that, that make a difference in everybody's daily life. So no. I, I am a congenital optimist. I know you are too. Yeah, this, so. this, this is why we get along so well and, and uh, so many facets to that wonderful response. And, and I don't mean this to just focus on a heritage research product, and in, in this case, the index of economic freedom. Although it is, it's, I didn't know how significant it was until I started spending time with ambassadors from other countries who'd come to heritage, and 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 they really want their governments vying for a higher position in, in that index. And it really speaks to the importance of really good objective research. Yeah. I had a, other meetings today, in addition to meeting with the former prime minister, Liz Truss, that focused on heritage products like the election integrity scorecard, like the education freedom report card. Where I'm going with that is not just for heritage, but for other public public policy organizations, whether they be focused on national policy or as so many of our audience members do, focus on state and state. local policy. That's a really good way of getting a lot of bang for your buck in terms of research, but because it becomes a a a, a lever, if you will, for policy action. Mm -hmm. And all of that to, to lead up to this question. If we were to, to compose as a conservative movement an index of freedom, no modifier, an index of freedom for the world, thinking about economic freedom, social freedom, religious liberty, where do you think the United States would rank? 13th percent. 14th percent, mm -hmm. not where it should be, yeah. the first percent. Uh, I was at a conference the last two days uh, talking about Indo-Pacific area, and one of my fellow Americans was telling me over lunch that the current Secretary of Energy has come out and said, uh, we will not have anything to do with climate deniers. And that if you ask anything that is considered uh, critical of our policy in terms of how we're dealing with the climate, we will automatically rank you as a climate denier. I mean, here's the government saying that, hey, the scientific method doesn't mean anything. Uh, you're, you're a negative, you're a naysayer. And then what you were saying earlier today about different government agencies keeping track of who were non-vaxxers. I mean, this is... This is scary stuff. It, it, it is literally unbelievable. I mean, I can't believe that we're waking up in the United States In the States United of States of America. Yeah. And yeah. this is what's going on. And yet, because it, we are both optimists, although we don't engage in hollow optimism here, to be sure, it seems as if the most, I guess most of the promising leaders in this generation of conservatism and next, it's not a political statement, just from, from the standpoint of, of, of political observers, policy observers, look like they're governors, whether they're Governor Yunkin, Governor DeSantis, Governor Abbott, Governor Nome. A lot of people will associate, the, associate those names with the 2024 presidential race. That's not why I'm asking. No, I'm no. asking from the standpoint of two guys whose main passion is ideas, yeah, yeah. but they put ideas into motion. Yeah, and, yeah. and it seems as if for anyone, this is the point, anyone who's, who's sort of depressed by this realism that you injected in the conversation about where the United States would rank in terms of freedom, that the present and future might be brighter than we let on if we, to the extent we can, exert our influence to help those kinds of leaders. Right, right. And I'd, I guess I'd go one step further and I'd say, to take it out of the 2024 context, you had Governor Pence. Before him, you had Governor Mitch Daniels, one of the uh, incredibly good governors, both incredibly good ones in, in my, my neighboring Hoosier state. You know, I'm originally an Illini, and I don't want to go back to Chicago. I mean, Illinois has just gone crazy. Uh, what they're doing now uh, in terms of the 
the left wing policies that are coming out of Springfield, uh, it's uh, it's it's depressing. Yeah. Anyway, but Indiana is different. No, it, it is different, and, I, and actually, that's that's something that I I, I wanted to uh, probe with you a little bit. So we'll just probe it now, sure. and that is in this this mindset that conservatives have about federalism that our states are laboratories of democracy. You see literally adjacent to one another, your native state, Illinois, and Indiana. Indiana is doing well by every objective measure. Illinois is, to be polite, not doing as well by every objective measure. What's the, What are the origins of that contrast? Because that didn't used to be the case. Growing up in Chicago, as I did... Uh, I, and, but then in the Republican suburbs of Chicago, I saw the, the big city run by the Dems. But back then, you know, you land at O'Hare Airport, used to be a big, big neon sign. Welcome to Chicago, the city that works. Richard J. Daley, mayor. You know, Richard J. Daley, card-carrying liberal Democrat. But by God, his city worked. It did. They picked up the garbage. They shoveled the snow. The streets were paved. You go there now, and man, you're afraid to walk down the street for fear you're going to be attacked or shot or mugged or something. Uh, my, my sister, the last member of my immediate generation, just fled to Florida last year. You know, she's, I'm not putting up with this anymore. Um, the, the basic rules just don't seem to apply anymore in so many places, whether it's uh, rule of law, equal treatment for everybody, which means, hey, you break the law? You're going to be held accountable for it. Uh, it there's not a thousand dollar threshold, in, as there is in Los Angeles or San Francisco, that well, if you're only stealing nine hundred dollars worth, uh, uh, you get a free pass. Man, you want to want to get rid of small business and middle middle sized business? That's a good way to do it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Soros, for your prosecutors and and the way he's changed some of these internal institutions. Yes, what the difference is. You've got threshold things like that happening that we didn't pay attention to as conservatives, and we should. Uh, talk to some of our mutual friends who were, in terms of mil uh, movement builders, uh, oh, well, we're, it's so great that uh, Heritage has now got 45 groups cooperating on our 2025 uh, version of Mandate for Leadership. That's really great. How many groups are on the other side working on the same thing? Maybe. 500, 600, you know, we're outnumbered 10 to 1. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and Across the board in every yeah, issue. Yeah, everything. Right? Yeah. And, you know, I get excited because I've been a strong supporter, as you well know from your days at Texas Public Policy, of the state think tank movement. And, yeah, we got one in every state, and we've even got some states with two or three. So that's why we got 55, you know. Yes, I know there are only 50 states, but there are 55 state think tanks uh, on our side. Uh but you look around and see what the other side has done in terms of building institutions. And, of course, the way they build it, it's a lot easier because they just go, go to the government and say, give us a handout. You know, conservatives, by and large, won't do that. So we have to go out and convince our supporters who believe in the market and is this organization really producing. But building those institutions is so important in terms of it, how we change things. Yeah. It, it takes a long time. You know, we, we had this conversation in a, in a different setting earlier today. And I, I guess as a Burkean and, and um, someone who often taught Burke and Aristotle in political philosophy classes, I think in terms of institutions. Yeah. Yes, policy and politics matter. Ideas matter. But ultimately, I think what we're living through right now and seeking your reaction to this, um, I don't think we've talked about this directly. What I think we're living through right now is what I call a second American revolution. And I'm always very clear when I say that publicly that I'm not talking about bloodshed. It's, it's the left that engages in that. Think about the BLM riots of 2020. That's, that's bloodshed. What I'm talking about is what Americans set out to do in the days, months, and years following the defeat of the British, which was realizing that the institutions they had, churches, economic patterns, uh, commercial relationships, needed to be at least modified and in some cases upended. So for example, in, in the state where we both live, uh, Virginia at that point, the old light churches saw membership really change to new light churches. Alexander Hamilton, as you know, no doubt, became an attorney for a lot of 
British loyalists who wanted to stay in the United States because of friendships and commercial relationships. And so he helped them navigate back into the world of these new institutions. All of that to say, I think that's what conservatives are up to more than anything in the 21st century is recognizing that many of, if not most of our longstanding institutions no longer serve the values that Americans used to transmit from one generation to the next. You yourself, I think, were way ahead of most of us in realizing that's where a lot of conservatives needed to spend their time and their treasure and their talent in addition to what they were doing in policy and politics. What's your sense of that diagnosis, which seems to be one of an emerging consensus in the the conservative movement? As you you know... uh, I did my bachelor's degree in uh, the Rocky Mountain West uh, with the Jesuits. Who sometimes uh, are Catholic. (laughs) (laughs) You knew I had to say that. (laughs) Yes, uh, I knew you would. Yeah, yeah. The difference between uh, Martin Luther and the Jesuits is Martin Luther knows he's no longer a Catholic. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Uh, uh, But it it was a Jesuit institution, and it, 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 frankly, it kind of lost its way. So Wyoming Catholic is up there, not as big as Regis, not as big a budget, not as many students, but by gosh, uh, you're carrying on in terms of the institutional base that we need. Um, Glenn Youngkin invited me to come in and serve as commissioner, uh, chairman of his commission on appointing board members to the state universities in Virginia. Wow, I took a good hard look. Uh, I accepted the job, but These are some of the the world's great universities. Virginia Tech, the University of Virginia, founded by President Thomas Jefferson. William and Mary, the second oldest university in the United States. Uh, Woke is everywhere. Uh, The uh, the whole DEI business. Right now, the University of Virginia has something like 110 DEI employees. I asked the uh, our, our counselor the, from the attorney general's office in, in uh, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia, I said, how many are they required by statute to have? He said, they're not required to have any by statute. They're required to have one person to make sure they're in compliance with Title IX. But in terms of DEI, there's no requirement at all. It's just this thing that everybody says. And, you know, uh, Governor Yunkin, I, I think, says it very well. He says it's not DEI, it's DOI, diversity opportunity and in inclusion, not diversity equity and in inclusion. And that's a that's a good distinction because opportunity, we're all in favor of more opportunity, but equity implies everybody's going to turn out equal and you know it's it's not just a quality of opportunity. It's 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 this kind of leveling down that that is so objectionable to me as a conservative and that but your your point about going back to the founders and you know de Tocqueville had it uh, almost 200 year 190 years ago when he was visiting the United States about the the local institutions about what we call subsidiarity you know you get down and boy you don't go to the government to solve every problem hey uh, my family, if we've got a challenge, we're going to try to figure it out at the family. If we can't figure it out at the family, uh, you know, maybe it's a cousin or somebody else will help us, or maybe we have to go to our church or to uh, the VFW or some organization we belong to. Or, you know, but, but you don't automatically say I'm, I'm entitled to a government handout, you know. Oh, well, uh, you got to relieve me of my student loan debt because uh, I can't afford it. Hey. You know that that's not my my fault, Buster. You know. No, that that's right, and 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 yet it, it seems as if as we're diagnosing the, the somewhat disappointing midterm elections for those of us who are conservatives, that President Biden's decision to forgive a lot of the student debt was had at least a a modest political impact, and and that so let's just posit that that's correct. It probably is. We don't know for sure. Let's just posit that it is for the sake of the question. How can conservatively minded Americans then communicate that politically message to people who are becoming accustomed to government handouts? Uh, 
the going back to your your assumption and uh, uh, and presumption. Yeah. I'd say it, it's more than that. I think it's a fact. The, the exit polls that I've seen indicate that a lot more 18 to 30-year-olds who are going to get these rebates on their, uh, on their student loans turned out than usually turn out in midterm elections. So, you know, he, he got his base out, and they voted the way he wanted them to, and instead of the red wave, we had a kind of a pink ripple. Uh, and, you know, that's, that, was, that was kind of discouraging. How do we convince those people that they're, or those citizens, that they can't always depend on government? Well, I think the first thing that'll happen is that the courts are going to say, "Hey, you're not going to get it." And Joe Biden acted unconstitutionally when he said he was going to give it to you, uh, because looking at the the statutes, I'm not a lawyer, thank God, <laughs> uh, but but you know there, there there no legal justification for what what he was proposing, and and it was uh, strictly a, a political thing, but. Uh, so perhaps, back, if, no, if, if I may, yeah, just, sure, sorry, sure, to, sure. sorry for the interjection, no, no, no. it occurs to me that that group of Americans, you yeah. and I both know yeah. well, uh, they, don't, they don't like being lied to. I mean, no one likes being lied to, but what there is a great skepticism among Americans, actually, say, 35 and younger, toward what government does, not necessarily because they see it as an ideological thing, as you and I might, that is a, a certain hostility toward over-centralization, but because they've been lied to. And it seems as if messaging might include from conservatives before, or in addition to what you've said, before we go on to other solutions. Guys, what has been sold to you is a fraud in two ways. The, the first is the tuition your university charged. But secondly, the president saying that he actually has the power to do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think those kind of uh, I tend to divide the the politically active American uh, constituency into kind of three uh, three broad categories: the saints, the sinners, and in the middle, the savables. Uh, you know, the saints are on our side. Yes, you want to reinforce them. Uh, the sinners. Eh, yeah, maybe if we're in Hard the conversion sell. business, uh, but by and large, you let them go. So you work on the savables. And these guys should and gals should be savable if they're saying, hey, this ain't the way it's supposed to be. It's not working. So how do we go to them and say, hey, individual freedom means individual responsibility, too. If you're going to if you're going to take out a, a loan uh, to to go to uh, Slippery Rock or someplace to get your bachelor's degree, uh you better be prepared to pay for it. And in order to do that, you're going to have to suffer a little bit in the future because you're going to have to make those uh, interest and principal payments on it. And don't don't count on the, the guy who never had the opportunity to go to college to bail you out because you made some stupid decisions earlier. Um, it's, that's a hard sell. It's, it's more than a... a, a it's harder a than one, it should be. <laughs> yeah, a, more than a one-line tweet, mm -hmm. you know, to a specific person. And that's, you know... That's a big challenge we face. But back to the original, I guess, point I, I, I was making before, commending you for what you had the audacity to do instead of building, in terms of building up new institutions, that's very long term. I mean, you look and you count the number of really good, solid institutions, on, maybe you get up to 30 or 40 if you're really a pretty liberal grader. Were you a liberal grader when you were faculty? Member? I'll give you one guess on that, Doctor Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, but I was forgiving. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you, you know what I'm talking Absolutely. about. I mean, as I said, I've got 15 state universities and colleges in Virginia, and I can't think of one of them that's really very even-handed, uh, let alone slightly leaning to the right. Now, these are state institutions, I'll admit. Uh, but, I mean, that means they're taxpayer-funded institutions, which means, hey, maybe those taxpayers who are, are paying ought to have something to say, too, about what, what's going on in those institutions. But and that's, and going that's, through the institutions is a big, big, that's a generational thing. It, it, it is. I mean, that's, that's the longest of long-term games, right? Is I, it, it's only partially a joke when I tell people, I, I had a full head of hair 
when I got into building institutions, first a K through 12 school and then Wyoming Catholic College, very worthwhile projects. But it, it takes the better part of a generation for those even to cash flow. You know, our, our, uh, our, our friends who are starting the University of Austin, yes. literally in the shadow of, of my alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin, they're going to, to do well because they're properly resourced as they're starting. But, but even still, it's going to take a while for them to perfect their business model. That's to say, that's just on the kind of back end financial side. That's just to say nothing yet about what they're going to do in terms of, of uh, new problems cropping up as, as every institution encounters. So we have to be involved in that, but that can't be the only thing that we're involved in. And, and I think that's, that's appropriate too, because as I like to say, we've got some short-term tactical battles here in DC and state capitals and school board meetings that thankfully conservatives are not only engaged in, but we're winning. I, I mean, I think mm-hmm. conservatives flip something like 12 or 1300 school board seats this cycle. So we just have to have a, a certain comfort level with the reality. And you know this from your experience better than most, that you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but keep keep your eyes on the, the trajectory moving forward. So with that said, here we are in the early 2020s. And what this is the, the, really the question I've really been wanting to ask you all year. What of all the lessons you learned, especially when you were president of Heritage, but at, at, at any stop in your career, do you think are particularly applicable to conservatives in America today as we confront leading the next generation of conservatism? Let me answer that with two, in two parts. Number one, if you're a conservative listening to Kevin Roberts' podcast, you got two of the important three eyes. You got the ideas, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. You got the individuals, because you know who you should be listening to, either the guests. Roberts or his the guests. guests. Uh, but you don't have the institutions. You got to help build the institutions. You got to recover the institutions if it's higher education or if it's uh, your daily newspaper by getting in there and, and writing letters to the editor or giving them op-eds that they can't keep turning down, like Bill Middendorf still does at age 98 in, in Rhode Island, our former trustee. Uh, so those, it, it's the three eyes, And the other one is to remember that in, in politics, there are no permanent victories, as we know, who were so victorious at the time of Ronald Reagan and the fall of the Berlin Wall and all the great things that were happening. And I was writing speeches about uh, everybody has given up on socialism. Socialism's over. Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek were right. It's all... Uh, man, here we are 25 years later, and look at what we're up against. Uh, not only socialism, but state control of so many institutions, it means that you got people spying on other people and uh, every, everything we've already talked about. So there are no, no permanent victories. But at the same time, there are no permanent defeats. Uh, the, the, the recent midterm elections, gosh, I was frankly a little bit depressed afterwards. Then somebody said to me, well, Eddie, are we better off today than we were the day before the election? Well, yeah, we are. We're not as better off as I wanted to be, but we are better off. So, you know, you got to look at the bright side and be that congenital optimist. But what there always are, no permanent victories, no permanent defeats, but there are permanent battles. And the battles... For the institutions, you know, 25 years ago, hey, Fulner, you shouldn't have given up and said, hey, we won this already. It's over. It isn't over. You got to keep keep in there day after day and year after year fighting those those encroachments on 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 freedom of choice, on uh, rule of law universally applied on all the things we believe in so that we can have more uh, prosperity and civil society and everything that heritage stands for. So I often ask this question at the beginning of the podcast because you and I know each other. I guess it didn't occur to me then, but it it strikes me that some of our audience will not know how it is you got into the work that you've done basically for your entire adult life. Uh, 
back in, in my undergraduate days with the Jesuits in Denver, Colorado, I had the great good fortune of uh, learning from two professors of history, actually. I never majored in history, but... Uh, Not everyone's uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but that ideas have consequences. Uh, one of the first books I ever read on the conservative side was by probably a forgotten Austrian, uh, Eric von kunolt uh Liberty or Equality. I thought to myself when I saw the title, I said, well, I'm in favor of both. Well, but you read you read Eric's book, and he became a, a family friend in later years. Uh, man, you know, here's one path you can take. There's another path you can take. Which way are you going to go? And from that, uh, the the professor who put me on that book said, "Well, you ought to read Russell Kirk, The Conservative Mind." Wow, that opened something up. This was before Milton Friedman and and the rest of it. I found through that a group called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I became involved with them. I attended some of their uh, their forums. Uh, met Phil Crane, who ended up having a, a big impact on my life when he became a congressman, and I went to work with him and uh, got a Weaver Fellowship for the first year ISI had them. Went to the London School of Economics, met some really neat professors and uh, heard Friedrich Hayek lecture in person and things like that. So it was kind of a, an immersion in the conservative movement very early on. And from there, came back to Washington uh, Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, where I had a fellowship, and that led me to work on Capitol Hill and uh, from Capitol Hill, where we started the Republican Study Committee. By that time, Crane was a member of the Study Committee, uh, was a member of the Congress and, and the founder, really, of the Republican Study Committee. And from that became came Heritage. And so it kind of set me on my life track. And somewhere along the line, I had to tell my father, no, Dad, I'm not going home and joining the family real estate business in downtown Chicago. And that here I be, am. <laughs> that had to be a big, big decision. <laughs> it was. It was. So... Last question. I think you've you've answered this in a lot of ways, but uh, looking for um, looking forward to this response. A lot of people who listen to this show or watch it are, I would say, supernaturally hopeful because of their faith, obviously. But I always try to get them to also be hopeful about this life, in spite of how elections go, in spite of how some policy debates go. Heritage, of course, has never been bashful about weighing in and, and expending resources to win fights, legislative fights we think are worthwhile. But you know where I'm going with this is, is that a lot of people are feel beleaguered. They think that perhaps America's best days are behind us, that perhaps conservatives are just managing the decline of the republic. But I know you well enough to know that you woke up this morning optimistic about the future. Why? Gosh, Why? Uh, first, because the Lord gave me another day in my 81st year. Uh, secondly, because my grandson had a, played a good basketball game yesterday afternoon up in Connecticut. Uh, but because there are so many opportunities out there, not just for me, but for the kids, for the grandkids. And gosh, everything we can do in terms of talking to my granddaughter in suburban Philadelphia last night, Hey, Poppy, I got a hundred on my English test. Isn't that great? Wow, you know, Sarah, that's terrific. You know, she probably only got a ninety-two in history, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, what are we going to transmit to the next generation? We can't sit back on our laurels and say, "Well, we did the best we could." Uh, uh, time for bourbon on the rocks or something like that. that. That's not what we're about as conservatives. It's not what we should be about anyway. We should be out there saying, hey, what can we do today to make the world a better place, place for the ideas we believe in? Yes, for me first for our immediate family, for ourselves and our immediate family, but then beyond that for the world out there, which is why during the time I was at Heritage, I was always happy to even when uh, George Mitchell, the late Democrat uh, leader of the Senate, uh, but also Newt Gingrich, said, Fulner, we want you to serve on the Bipartisan Commission on UN Reform. 
Oh my gosh. You know, let's not reform it. Let's just convert the the New York headquarters into co-ops and, you know, <laughs> send them all home, as, as Chuck Lichtenstein once said with Gene Kirkpatrick. Uh, but no, I mean, you, you see an institution out there, and if there is something out there that you might be able to have an influence on changing, get out there and, and, and try to make it better. Try to use that human capital inside you to, to do positive things as, as you look forward. And that's why I get so encouraged, whether I'm, I'm watching a TV commercial with Franklin Graham saying what he's doing or what Spirit of America is doing in terms of, of helping out Ukrainian refugees and uh, so many other positive things that are going on in the world today. I, I, at the same time, I, I get up in the morning and I say a prayer for the likes of the, the Jimmy Lies of the world, you know, now back in before a Chinese judge on his fourth or fifth trial in the last two years so he can serve another consecutive term to basically life imprisonment for standing up for freedom in in Hong Kong and in China. Uh, You know, we have so many friends out there, free friends who, and as you know, one of the things I feel very strongly about, I just stepped down as the chairman of the Victims of Communism Foundation who, We've just opened this museum down here to where the basic theme of the hundred million people who've basically been killed by by communist tyranny over the last century, the basic theme is remember us. You know, if you remember them, you can't sit back on your laurels and say, well, the uh, world's going to hell, we uh, forget about it, and, and there's nothing I can do. No, you got to do whatever you can because every day you got new challenges and new opportunities to say what we're about and why our way of doing things is better. And that's well, I am optimistic. Uh, no, I was just uh, I'm smiling here for people who are listening rather than watching because uh, you are just as optimistic and just full of of, of uh, cheerful fighting spirit as you've always been. And I have heard over the months and years I've asked that question in different forums perhaps never a more poignant response. And so what a, what a fitting way to conclude a great conversation. Um, we'll do this again, hopefully Thank many you. times. But let me say, on behalf of a, of a grateful conservative movement, Dr. Ed Fulmer, thanks for everything you've done. And thanks for joining me. Thank you, Kevin. Great to be with you. Thanks for joining this episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. Obviously, a special conversation for me and for those of us at Heritage, but I know so many of you in the audience know that what Ed Fulner has done for this country and for the conservative movement is special to you as well. We'll see you next week with another mover and shaker who is also an optimistic American patriot. Take care.